Hey folks, and welcome to the Deconstructor of Fun podcast. I'm your host, Mishka Katkoff, and in this episode, we'll be talking about, talking more about admonization, because uh, just a while back, we had Felix Brauberg, uh, an overall great admonization consultant and a, and a great human being. So he was on the podcast talking about branded ads and games, talking about Amazon and Apple entering the ads business, the efficacy of different ad formats, how a game can double its ad revenue, privacy changes, and what the ad monetization will be like in 2024. That podcast is in this podcast flow. Whatever app you're using, just scroll back and there's ad apocalypse episode. So that's yours if you want to get into really understanding kind of like the, uh, the, the fundamentals. In this one, we're going to go a little bit in a more relevant and insightful information about ad monetization. So Google Ads has been making and will be making a lot of changes. And I wanted to discuss these changes that affect ad monetization uh, by bringing a person from Google, Google Ads, uh, and a person from a big publisher that is known for their excellence in, in among other, ad monetization, that is uh, Quali. Uh, so uh, I hope you enjoy this podcast. I, I really suggest that you check out also the uh, the podcast episode with Felix Brauberg if you haven't done that. And both Google and Quali will be at Istanbul event uh, next week. So hope to see you there. And if you can't be there, make sure you sign up and you can actually stream the uh, the event. So thank you. And without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, do enjoy the podcast. Welcome to the Deconstructor of Fun podcast. Uh, today we're discussing advanced ad monetization trends with Google and Quali. And my guests are uh, Ross Brockman, head of EMEA Mobile Apps Partnerships at Google, with over 10 years of experience at forefront of online advertising, firstly in search and subsequently in mobile. Ross is currently responsible for Google's app developer partnership. Ross, welcome to the podcast. John Wright, then, uh, head of publishing at Quali. I hope I'm right with, with the title. Uh, vice, vice president. Vice, vice president. Vice, vice president of a publishing, a UK based developer and publisher founded by game industry legends. It has quietly become a dominant player in the hyper and hybrid casual game, along with publishing casual and PC games. And just based on John's uh, LinkedIn presence, I wouldn't say that it has quietly become a dominant player. I would say quite loudly <laughs> become a dominant player in the space. So, John, welcome back to the podcast. Thank you, Miska. Pleasure as always. <laughs> so, uh, so we're doing almost like an emergency episode because of um, because of the trends in ad monetization, and in a way, this is kind of continuum to the uh, the last year. End of last year, we did an episode with Felix Brauberg talking about things like branded ads and games, Amazon, Apple entering the ads business, the efficacy of different ad formats, how a game can double its re ad revenue, the effect of privacy changes, and what ad monetization will look like. And now it's twenty twenty four. Um, we're up and running and boy, oh boy, uh, if it didn't start like the last year ended. So I think there's a lot of topics to cover in the ad monetization front, especially the things that have been changing. So jumping headfirst into some of these changes. So Ross, uh, Google ads has been making several announcements last year. Can you walk us through, through these announcements of 23? Sure. Very, very happy to, but maybe I should do a little explaining first, just to kind of say what we're talking about. So, I mean, I don't know, John, let's, let's ask you, how many people do you know who work at Google? A uh, couple of dozen, maybe. Yeah. Um, yeah. But this particular period in time that you're talking about, Mishka, is, is one of those moments where it does matter who does what inside the, the country that is, that is Google. Um, because the Google Ads teams are quite distinct from our sales side teams who work on, on AdMob and, and Ad Manager. So, just taking a step back, those those Google Ads teams are responsible for spending all of the budgets that, that Google gets from advertisers, uh, and they spend that budget across a wide variety of Google properties, as well as the publisher network, all the game developers that we we know and love, um, and they are always optimizing for for advertiser value in that process. The sell side teams, uh, the part of the business that I'm on, run our ads platforms. And we're here to optimize for sustainable publisher revenue. So while the Google Ads teams are our friends and colleagues on one hand, uh, on the other, they are just another buyer and we're a platform facilitating their demand. 
Is that distinction helpful? Does that does that make sense? Yeah, makes sense. Okay, so then I think the journey we're on started probably back in May last year when the Google Ads team announced they would be moving primarily towards real-time bidding um, by October 31st. And at the same time, they expanded access to, to additional bidding solutions that they've been building for a while. Um, and please do jump in with any, any questions you have as we, as we go through. Um, but let me take a minute to unpack what that means. So ad buying in mobile, as, as Felix has talked about before, is, is for a long time has been running through waterfalls. Uh, and waterfalls, for those not familiar, um, effectively mean calling multiple times at different price floors because any publisher always wants to get the highest price for a given ad. But the way that they got that highest price was by configuring different price floors saying, I would only accept an ad above a certain price. And then you'd have to go and see if an ad network responded at that price. Uh, if a network did respond, great, you, you got that price. If no networks responded, you would just do it again at a lower price. And again, and again. So finding the point at which your price was maximized could take tens or even hundreds of requests if you really wanted just for, for one impression to get that price. And I think for those with children, this probably sounds familiar. It sounds like someone coming back, can I have a suite? No. How about now? No. How about now? No. And so on. And, and the analogy kind of holds in that it's time consuming and it's inefficient. Uh, it makes for apps which used an awful lot more data in that process and took an awful lot longer to deliver an ad, which is it's rubbish for the users, takes a lot longer, and it's not great for developers. So that to and fro is inconvenient, um, but it's also a less efficient way for advertisers to buy. So I'm no kind of trained economist, but in principle, when a seller and buyer can't agree on a way to value something, a service is good, whatever, where price is the key factor, then market inefficiencies creep in. And this process for exploring for prices wasn't anyone coming to an agreement. It was kind of a, a one-sided negotiation um, and it created a, a bit of inefficiency. And our friends at Google Ads were able to make this comparison around the inefficiency quite easily because they'd been buying in real time in other places. And so they identified that that performance uh, difference was pretty material. And then they decided they, they weren't going to participate anymore in being asked 10 times for an ad for one impression and were moving towards a single auction. And tools existed to configure this alternative bidded form of access had been live in, in AdMob and, and Ad Manager for a while. And so in May, they did signal that this was eventually going to be the only way to buy um, starting at the end of October. And, and this was a surprise to us, right? Coming back to that separation. So on the sell side, we found out when everyone else did. Um, and that announcement fired the starting gun on a lot of work on our side, helping publishers get ready and manage this, this migration by moving towards, towards real-time bidding. Um, I'll pause there. Like, I don't know how you experienced that bit, John, or like whether you were suitably startled at the same time, but um, like how, how did that go for you? Yeah, I mean, from, from my perspective, Ross, obviously we've been talking about bidders in mobile now for five, six plus years. Um, you know, traditional waterfall having an instance and then looking at the subsequent CPM and looking at the fill rate, right? An idea of optimization would be maximizing what fill rate or the best fill rate you could get at the highest eCPM equals the maximum or the most amount of ad revenue you could get, right? And the idea was we were always focusing on that. Um, obviously, over the last couple of years, bidders have become um, you know, much more adopted within the space. And we, we use various bidders within our waterfall structure for using our mediation. Um, I think uh, you know, all of that is moving forward in a very logical position. As you said, there's also a case of multiple calls creates uh, lag, you know, it creates a uh, slowdown on serving, you know, there's a lot of negatives that come around that. The, um, I've said the one argument or the one sort of con of this is developers sometimes feel like they're losing a lack of control when it comes down to what they're actually going to earn. Because if you have a bidder and the bidder says, this is, you're going to get $10, but actually you, you would wanted 15 for this, even though the fill rate is 100% because it's a bidder, this uh, can 
um, in some cases, reduce the ARPU of the user because of that. So it's, I think that's where some of the concern from the developer community came from. It's if Google are forcing this decision and being bidder only, is it going to somehow have a potentially a negative impact rather than a positive one? Yeah, I, and I, th I think that's fair, right? Because um, as I mentioned before, this wasn't the most efficient setup. Um, it's one of those moments where, where advertiser efficiency and publisher earnings were a little bit in, in tension. Um, if I'm honest, that inefficiency in advertiser spend that the, this kind of the waterfall setup introduced, um, it had to go somewhere and it was going to publishers um, and the control they had was was good for publishers at that point. And this was yeah a, a change that was encouraged away from that, that model and still, there was a little bit of resistance. Um, and so I think that's kind of why the Google Ads team realized that they were going to have to work a little bit more closely with publishers to, to get this across the line. Um, and they did actually provide some more detail towards the end of last year, um, towards September. They were clear as to what, they got a little bit clearer as to what was going to happen at the end of October. Um, Google talks about enforcing many things, and I think people wanted a, an awful lot more detail to be, to be sure what was going to happen. Mm -hmm. And so the, the announcement then was that if publishers wanted to keep receiving bids from Google Ads, then they did need to at least configure a bidding ad unit alongside their waterfall. Yeah. Um, and that meant that some of that inefficiency would go away and, and the Google Ads team could start to see what the, the value of this change was. Um, so uh, they were clear about that, but it, which I think everyone was hoping for, that if you set up a bidding ad unit, you'd still be able to receive uh, bids from them. Uh, if you didn't set up a bid ad, bidding ad unit, they were going to stop responding to that waterfall chain. And I think that's that second part, bearing in mind that many publishers, yourselves included, were making three, five, ten more calls for a single ad impression. Um, there was a lot of nervousness, I think, around that change when you looked at your your distribution of revenue, and it was coming from a whole bunch of calls at a whole bunch of price points. And suddenly this was that control, as you mentioned, was, yes. was going away. So how did you think about it before and after that announcement, John? It would be interesting to, to hear. I mean, ultimately, I think from our perspective, Ross, we had like a decision or flexibility in somewhat um, to test. Um so for, from our perspective, we could have the bidders in place, but the floors in place also so that it couldn't go below a certain amount, right? So we had like a fail safe system in place to ensure that yeah, the amount of ad revenue we got, you know, would stay into a predictable sort of um, level. Um, after the decision was made to make this, um, you know, take this decision away from us and, and move forward with only a bidding strategy in place for Google, Obviously, this is something that could potentially impact us quite heavily because Google make up a huge percentage of our ad revenue business. So, you know, I, I don't think it was um, a very a, a negative um, sort of impact from our perspective. It was just more of a case of that we have to understand that there is going to be an impact to our business and we have to understand what the full impact of that is so we can strategize moving forward for the best case scenario of maximizing our ad revenue with Google as a valid partner. Yeah, and I think that was the feedback we got from a lot of people all of a sudden towards the end of the year when these changes were coming in and you're being asked to submit your budgets and your plans for the next year. And a lot of people were kind of shrugging and being like, well, I, I don't know, because this change could be dramatic or it could be could be minimal. But I think what was clear there was that being able to have bidding alongside Waterfall allowed for the smoothest transition. And so we spent, a, I think I spent most of last year talking to most of our, our publisher partners, encouraging them if that was their setup to definitely move to that hybrid yeah. um, view of having bidding on water four. And I think that that really helped. So that bit I think was was kind of relatively smooth. Uh, it, it did get a little more focused again towards the end of the year um, when the Google Ads team made some different announcements about evading kind of multi-call detection in, in waterfalls. Uh, and I think you'd, we've been very simplistic, I think, about the, the level of optimization that is possible inside uh, that old waterfall setup. And I know Felix went into an awful lot more depth about this before Christmas. Um, but 
there was one behavior which was was quite clear in the market that publishers had found that uh, if you kind of sticking with my analogy from beforehand, if you sent a different person almost to ask uh, for the price, that's the kind of the equivalent of changing the the ad unit um, that a uh, request was labeled with, then there was an advantage to to kind of changing your ad units and, and asking repeatedly. Um, so in December, there was another update, which I think people reacted to quite strongly as well uh, from Google Ads, that that approach of changing and using different ad units every time you asked for uh, for an ad was, was not acceptable. Um, and I think the the change that we talked about before, the the need to add a bidding call, um, I think that was probably I would characterize that as a strong preference from Google Ads that that was that needed to be set up. Um, but they and they reserve the right to respond to ad calls however they please. But I think in in this case, the announcement before Christmas was clear that this was not an acceptable practice, um, and that if you were trying to move these ad units around in a way that, that obfuscated the plan, this was going to be considered as abuse. Um, and kind of slipping back into Google speak, like abuse is, is not uh, a word that's taken lightly when we, we talk about our, our ads teams. Um, and in this case, they communicated fairly clearly that they would be prepared to stop responding and, and stop, uh, stop purchasing inventory from apps which were carrying out this, this practice. And that would mean no Google Ads demand at all to your app for between a week to a month, they communicated. Um, and so that was that was quite a transition. And was that something you thought about differently, John? I mean, it kind of depends on how advantageous this was and whether you were using it beforehand. I'm not trying to, to trip you up here by any means. No, I mean, from, from our perspective, I don't believe we were. So I don't think we were, you know, in, you know using this particular practice. Um, I would have to speak to my head of monetization, who actually is the person that manages the, the mediation and the waterfall and such. But yeah, I, I don't believe we were, Ross. Okay. So so that's good. Um, but I think it's kind of just trying to kind of step through this, understand why it got to quite such a, uh, a period at the end of the year. I know Felix was Felix loves a good ad apocalypse. Um, and uh, <laughs> we were kind of getting towards that. But like, it, how well understood do you think everything was at the end of the year, Mishka, on that from... Uh, what was the mood when you recorded that previous podcast? Uh, I mean, the, the mood is always in the sense that everybody is a little bit cautious of the platforms and the platform changes that are happening. Uh, it's kind of hard to be proactive. So <laughs> these things come and then you have to react. And so actually, as you, as you guys were talking about, so you were talking about Waterfall. And I just want to take it back to the concept so that most of the people understand what we're talking about instead of only the app monetization people. But with, with Waterfall, very understandable. So you're calling multiple different price floors. You have hundreds of requests to find the proper price. It took a long time and wasn't efficient, so it's now a single call, aka real-time bidding. But there's two other concepts that you raised that I think need a little bit of an explanation for the folks that are not ad monetization experts. One is, what is a bidding ad unit in practice? And the second one is multi-call detection. So Ross, if you will. Uh, yes, sure, sure. Sorry for kind of get rushing ahead on, the, on those things. So I think that the bidding ad unit's the easiest one to to discuss. Um, previously, as I said, the the way in a waterfall that you would request an ad is you would set a price floor and you would ask if someone could beat it. Uh, and if that was the case, then someone would return, like your ad network would return an ad. You know it was above that price, and and you would be able to serve it. You wouldn't know exactly what price it was. Um, a bidding ad unit works slightly differently. Um, the real time auctions are where everyone effectively would put a price on the table at the same time and the highest bid would win. So it's a differently configured ad unit within our systems and within other network systems that competes differently in a third party auction, as opposed to just returning an ad if you can if you can repeat a price floor. Does, does that help? Makes, makes a lot of sense. Sounds like a Google cool. search almost. Yes, yes, a little bit clearer. Um, and then the the multi-call aspect of it. So as I said, the the way these waterfalls were set up, you can you can tell generally um, if that is what's being done, um, that someone is asking multiple times to try and get the, the best price. Um, that I think is is something that 
this is that the Google Ads team wants to remove the inefficiency from. And they're able to do that when they, they can look at kind of bidding ad units alongside Waterfall. Um, there were occasions where you could try and make it look like that wasn't what was happening. Um, and one of the ways of, of doing that, as I said, was instead of asking for different prices using the same ad units, you would just change the IDs associated with them every single time. Um, and that seems to be, it, it's a behavior there that doesn't really serve a purpose other than trying to hide um, multiple from, mm -hmm. from obviously. And so that's why the, the stance on that was a lot stronger um, versus the recommendation that uh, that people should add a bidding ad unit. It was a much stronger request framed as, as abuse that um, that people should not be trying to dodge and, and hide these things. Mm. Ross, I mean, I've got a question because I haven't yeah. heard of this. This is quite interesting. Like, how would they change the ID uh, to, to basically to do the abuse it's, uh, itself? Like, how, how would it work? I mean, maybe you don't actually say that, but I'd be cu I'm curious to understand it a bit more. It's, it's relatively simple. I, I think any ad unit in almost any network has uh, has a specific ID associated with it, and, and that identifies it on the, the kind of host network's systems. And you could have something where you set an ad unit up that's got a $10 floor and it's got this ID. And then you could set up a different ad unit that has a $10 floor with a different ID and just swap between them, for example. That's a really simplistic example. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And another thing, Ross, that you mentioned or asked John, or either way, I forgot, but was discussion was reduction of ARPU, which is the uh, the main point. And mm -hmm. if the companies are seeing reduction ARPU in ad ARPU, then especially with a portfolio like, let's say, Quali, that has a significant portion of their revenue coming from ad monetization, that has a profound impact on not only the financials, but also their uh, ability to acquire users and how much they are actually paying for users. So kind of like directing this question to, uh, to John is like, um, how big of a change would it be if this would decrease the art pool that you're seeing from that monetization to the uh, operations of a of a hybrid casual or a casual publisher the major concern from our perspective is again if if this changes from a hybrid solution to a pure bidder will it have a negative input uh, input on our pool, or will it have a positive one it could be either either and ultimately when you had the um, the ability to have instances and flaws you knew that it wouldn't go below a certain level, right? And again, there's this ca calculation around fill rates, different floors. Is the bidder, the bidder, the idea of the bidder is to find the maximum potential eCPM that you can get without having a fixed position, right? So instead of 20 to 15, you could have $16.99. So the idea is that, you know, before bidders, you could, but you would only have 20 to 15, or most people's waterfall sales would have like 20, 19, 18, etc. But the bidder should be able to um, provide you with higher CPM in theory. Um, however, in reality, you know, taking away the ability to do the hybrid, there is an element of risk which it could be negative. At the moment, I think a lot of people just don't know if that is going to, you know, how that's going to play out and. After the announcement at the end of last year, people then have that option taken away from them. And that's why I think there's been you know, a lot of you know, discussion in the industry. People, because again, it's uh, until it happens, we're not going to really know uh, or not know fully. So I think, uh, yeah, you know, what, what, what we're hoping is that the ARPUs go up, Mishka. Yeah, of course. But if they do drop, you know, if they do drop, is it going to be by 10%, 15%? Who knows? But 10% to us is millions of dollars. So, you know, that is, that is the, the, the general concern for all sort of ad revenue-based games business, I think. Yeah. But I think most of those changes have happened, John. So like, is this a case that, that you haven't noticed? Like, is that like, probably the, the best possible outcome, right? Yeah, I mean, I think at least from um, an industry perspective for us right now, generally our poos and, and our DAOs are lower, but I don't think it's probably because of this. Right. So maybe some of the sort of economical changes and some of the headwinds in games is actually detracted from the positivity that this perhaps has brought because other factors have reduced. So for us, we're not looking at it as Google changing a bidder as, as, as improved or detracted. We're looking at 
all of the other components that make the impact to the game performance, right? But so if we were to, we wouldn't go into that that granular element. We would just say, okay, CPMs are down, ARPUs are down. Um, no, that's bad for us. You know, Google Gate is you know enforcing a bidder. Is that going to you know positively or negatively impact? Is it going to be masked by other decisions by other factors? You know, that I think that's what most studios are, are, are trying to figure out right now. Hmm. Uh, there, there's other things happening at the same time as well. So uh, there was a new consent requ- consent requirement uh, launching, I, think, I believe, this quarter, if it hasn't launched already, which affects both Google Publisher products and Google Ads uh, demand, adding even more volatility to the whole situation. So, Ross, can you talk about this, uh, this consent requirement? Yeah, yeah, it never it never rains, but it pours. We had a, a busy last year in terms of these these changes coming down the pipe, and yeah, kind of to John's point about how sometimes how hard it can be to disentangle these these shifts. Uh, we're right in the middle of of this one as well. Um, so it's probably an easier discussion to to understand um, than the the waterfall dynamics that we were going through before. Um, I mean. Users' expectations for, for privacy are changing, and we're seeing this reflected in a lot of worldwide regulation. Um, and every platform publisher and advertiser that has to take this seriously. They don't have a choice as a result because it's it's regulatory requirements. Um, and user consent in particular is increasingly necessary for data processing purposes. Um, and that's probably a hard principle to argue with if you were if you really want to pin someone down. Um, but it's especially important in the European Union because the, the user rights are very strongly protected here. And, and given that, that means there will be stronger forms of consent needed this year. Um, so if you have users in, in the EEA or the UK, which I right. expect most developers will, um, then you will need to explain to those users that there is data collection which takes place in order for ads to be served in your games. Um, or your apps, and you will need to ask their consent for that uh, for that data collection. And that consent is necessary for, for Google Ads to serve personalized ads, which I think everyone agrees is better than unpersonalized. Um, and that's true regardless of, of platform. Um, it's across, across any of the platforms that people might be using. Um, and for our platforms, it's, it's also necessary that we, we track that consent on, on AdMob and Ad Manager to make sure that we're not sharing user data to providers where users have not consented to to their data being shared with those entities. Um, And so the important thing from our side uh, on the sell side has been that all developers need to have a way to collect this consent. Um, Our products have added a a free feature to help publishers collect it because frankly, at this scale, there has to be a a free solution available. but to be clear, there are plenty of certified consent management platforms uh, that use uh, the standard in the marketplace that, that's administered by the IAB uh, called TCF. Uh, and any platform that's configured to comply with that is absolutely fine. Um, my teams do support the Google solution for this, but uh, we're not selling it in any sense of the word. Um, the important thing is that users are presented with choice and that that choice is then captured, and that that choice is then respected. Um, but as we saw with with ATT and any other kind of dialogue along those lines, um, yep. it, anything like that introduces the chance that users won't consent, um, and that, that that choice then has to be respected. Uh, and so that again is another impact that could affect the the competition for any given ad impression. Um, there are still non-personalized ads and other things that will be shown, but it's, it kind of feeds into that point I made towards the end of last year when you were asking your ad monetization teams for their forecast for 2024, they probably gave you a wider envelope than they ever had done before. Um, and I, I think that's, yeah, the combination of these two things is a big factor in that. Yeah, I, I definitely agree, Ross. I think like Google Sandbox, you know, everyone is, is sort of like still talking about this and we understand what the impact of IDFA deprecation had on iOS traffic. Um, Mishka and I were talking about this recently and, you know, from a company perspective, we used to spend 70% on, on Apple and, and 30% on, on Google in terms of our user acquisition. And then it, after IDFA deprecation, it went to 50-50. So Google ended up winning a lot of the you know the user acquisition spend, 
Um, and I think there is a general concern that with the privacy updates on Google that, you know, the, the sort of wins that we had with Google subsequently after the Apple changes will be lost um, because of privacy. Um, and I think this is something that a lot of people are being very careful and conservative with their projections for this year, just to understand, again, what the impacts on both the monetization and the user acquisition side will be. So I, I, I do think Google, by the way, are going to execute this better because Google being an ads business, I think you'll have more um, a more intricate way of deploying this to not affect as many publishers and developers like what happened with ATT. But I think it's going to be a big talking point of this year, basically. And how are you responding to it? Because and to my mind, it's coming from the sell side, not from the, the, the user acquisition side. But this feels like a a point in time where you might hold fire on your budgets or something. If your break-even point for acquiring a user falls in March, and as per what, what we've communicated, our enforcement on these things happens in March, then do you do you just wait and see and keep your powder dry until afterwards? What's the what's the rationale there? It's a really good point, Ross. Um, if I'm honest, I, I think a lot of developers are actually not doing that. If to be frank. Okay. I think if I think um, budgets are remaining the same, I think obviously it's harder to spend the money these days profitably, which means that you're spending less overall, right? As a company, we are spending less on user acquisition than we did a couple of years ago because you have to be more targeted, uh, you know, in the sense of like going after the, the correct sources in the right ways to, to make money. Um, but from a projection standpoint, we have an understanding that we expect you know, CPMs on the monetization side to drop a little bit and, and CPIs you know, might get a bit more, or CPIs might stay the same or get a bit more expensive. But, you know, we'll have to acquire, try and acquire users more effectively because the ARPU and the ARP DAOs will drop. Um, but from a long-term, like, PLTV, so projective lifetime value analysis and modeling perspective, we haven't made any mass um, decisions on, you know, retracting that. So we're continuing to move forward and, you know, we won't know until after the changes are finalized, if there is going to be, our models might need to be updated. So it's, okay, yeah, that's it's an interesting year, basically. True, but that's, it's encouraging that like, you don't seem to be kind of running scared of it in the extent that you're pulling budgets and things like this. It's kind of a, a wait and see, and maybe there's just more confidence this time around versus the larger, and, and frankly, global changes that ATT caused, um, maybe a European-based consent change, mm -hmm. a smaller smaller adjustment. Most of our business like, is done in the US anyway. So I think you know there is an element of that, Ross, right? Like our European revenue generation, news acquisition is 20 to 30% of global. Mm -hmm. So there is that. But I also think that you, know, you can't run scared. You know, we, we need to continue to do what we're doing and have trust in the abilities of the team and the products and everything we built. And if we end up, you know, in a couple of months finding out that again our models are, you know, under predicting or, or you know things are off, then ultimately, yeah, we've lost some money, but we've also learned a lot and we learn from that that failure and move forward. Um, I definitely wouldn't stop spending, right? I think that would be stupid because you need to keep people coming into the app, right? <laughs> So, yeah, I, I think, look, charge forward. That's interesting, you know, because we're, we're seeing maybe a little more questioning of that on the, the publisher side of things, because with all of these changes, as I said, so many of the, the kind of tips and tricks that, that were previously possible being shifted around by the Google Ads side of things, we're, I'm hearing a little bit more from publishers that people acknowledging that their historical data about what performance would be and kind of what the, the platforms were capable of is, is a little out of date. Um, and I think it's probably the right question to ask. Um, and so I think there's, there's quite a few people on our side who are beginning to say, okay, well, maybe this is the right time to see what's changed on all of the platforms that are out there and see if that actually makes a material difference to the LTVs and, and so on that you are obtaining through that because a lot of the things that were previously there were were not there so i mean sales hat on for a second so I, I would love to hear from any developers who are in that situation and want help gathering that data point um it feels like this reevaluation theme is is real 
Um, and we very much like to to help everybody who wants to who wants to make that reevaluation and and collect that data point. Mm. And and just you know, Ross, since you're a spokesperson for Google now, and I know you, in the beginning you tried to explain right. that Google is a gigantic organization that you, can, you there's no possibility to know what happens on, on on the different size of the business units. But nevertheless, like, what do you think is the impetus and, and the goal of these changes? Because they are quite significant. Like we we're now trying to analyze how they affect, uh, given all the other changes. But but it is significant significant change in the uh in ad monetization so what what is the goal here i think if i were to sum it up i think it's it's sustainability um i i definitely don't think and i understand some of the, the concerns that were had at the time that like money is going to be taken away or like it, it's it's google ads trying to spend less i mean i don't think that's the objective at all no one's here trying to say that money should come out of the mobile games ecosystem because it's bad there was just inefficiency in there. And if we want to keep it as a sustainable channel where revenue is being spent and coming into everyone's games um, in a sustainable fashion, then this is a change that makes the inventory more valuable to advertisers because it's bought more fairly. And I think that's good for the long-term health of the business when other changes and so on are, are coming through. Um, and I think that the kind of philosophical point around the consent side of things as i said it's it's very hard to sit here and, and argue with a straight face that user privacy is not important and we shouldn't be making changes that are that are positive to that kind of goal of collecting consent and respecting consent so i think in both of those cases we should end up with a more efficient ad buying um ecosystem um and it's freeing up i think and again, please keep me honest on this, John. I think it's, it's freeing up a bit of resource that we're beginning to see publishers kind of deploy in other kind of more optimistic and kind of value creating ways, right? There are people who have spent a long time organizing and, and optimizing waterfalls day in, day out. Um, that's less possible now, as, as John pointed out. But then we're beginning to see people invest in more sophisticated customization of either pricing on a per user basis or the experience of the game on a per user basis, um, setting different uh, offers and, and kind of different propositions in front of your users. And if you can't, if you have to kind of acquire in a less targeted fashion, which is what I've heard people say has, has happened on iOS, um, then you have to tailor the experience more to kind of drive more, execute, uh, more engagement and, and more monetization. So th that's a shift that I'm beginning to see. And it's something where as a platform, we're investing quite, quite heavily in allowing for more customization and optimization on a different axis than just the waterfall that's, that's called. Um, I don't know, as I said, please keep me honest on that, John. Is that the kind of the way that you're all thinking about things? C completely, Ross. I think, I mean, you know, from a live ops perspective, from a persona targeting perspective, you know, from serving different sort of, uh, I'm talking more about the in-app purchase side rather than the ad side here, but, you know, giving customized offers to individuals that have certain personas that we're tracking that, you know, what they are within the data, giving them, you know, limited time offers and, and discounts on certain price points of, of you know, um, values in the shop and, yeah, all of that stuff I think is is super interesting and where the business is going. And we used to be a predominantly 95% ad business and now we're becoming a you know, 70, 30, 60, 40 as to in our purchase business. So, you know, it's making us think a lot more smartly about our monetization strategy. And as you said, like, yeah, you know, I was one of those people that sat in front of a mediation optimizing waterfalls and adding instances. I was one of those people. There's not that role isn't going to exist in the future. Like, in my opinion, because well, the way that bidders have set up. So how people then, you know, advance their monetization strategies by becoming more inventive. And um, and this is exactly how I think people are going to continue to add value with, with this particular job uh, and role within, within the team. You're always going to need someone managing monetization, but they'll find new ways and uh, new inventive ways to, to actually deliver on that rather than spending hours looking at different instances and putting things up and down, right? Like, it, it was, it really was not the greatest uh, 
you know, this was a long time ago, but it wasn't the funniest part of my role. Well, it's a problem. It wasn't that long ago, which is why this does actually come across as progress, I think, once you, you kind of take a step back from the volatility. And I hope everybody yeah. does feel does feel that way. And I think you raise an interesting point around like finding different ways to optimize as a result. I think one of the, the areas where, aside from creating this flexibility to, to kind of move things around on the platform, just the concept of publisher, kind of what we call first party data, um, which you understand your users pretty well. You put a lot of analytics in your games about who does what, about who buys what, about um, the patterns that people follow through the games. Um, and over the years, I've had I think plenty of people say to me that uh, they assume that data must be worth something, <laughs> um, but no one really knows how to get more out of it. And I think we are now shifting into a phase where understanding your users and using that data to customize experiences, to customize pricing, to customize offers is actually just a, a different phase of, of value creation there. And that's actually something I... I, I'm optimistic that over the next year or so with some of the tools that we're, we're building at Google, we're pretty good at data, um, that we should be able to sit down and, and I want our clients to be able to go back to their C-levels, go back to their boards this time next year and be like, well, Google helped me make tangible amounts of money, like things we can definitely prove, like valuable chunks of change from our user data in a privacy-first way. And I think that that's one of the things that we're really kind of trying to tack towards as a platform there is being able to create that value and also meet the very, very high standards of privacy that that everyone's moving towards. Um, and so, yeah, I, I hope that people will be going back and saying Google helped us realize tangible value from our first party data in the next 12 months, because uh, it's a big investment on our side. Uh, John, something I wanted to uh, ask you, because as we were discussing with Ross about doing this episode, uh, he, you know, painted a pretty doom and gloom picture. He was saying that, uh, you know, what could happen is that the, uh, is essentially that the, uh, the way we're modeling right now, app monetization goes kind of out of the window and you would have to kind of go through again, through all of your partners and build new LTV models. And that of course would affect significantly your user acquisition. And, and, and through that, you, we would see almost a decline in the whole market for the, uh, the yep. couple of first quarters. Do you feel, do you, first of all, Ross, do you still feel it's that way? And secondly, yeah. you know, John, like, is this the case or not? I think that's stronger than than kind of we discussed before. Is, <laughs> that's how I hear. I'm, I only I'm I mean I live in hyper hyperboles, so. <laughs> so. No, no, it's, it's true. But I mean, yes, I say, ad apocalypses <laughs> are, are everywhere if you if you want to look for right. them. Um, I'm not trying to underestimate the scale of the changes. I like I spent all of last year running to ensure that the risk to like the, any risk from these changes was minimized by helping people understand what Google Ads were saying, helping our partners migrate to ways that minimized um, the the scale of any shift that are coming through. And frankly, I don't know, if if the bunch of these changes have happened and, and John hasn't come on here to like to say that it's been a material shift, then then I'm quite pleased with the the outcome of that. Um, it was more to acknowledge the scale of the potential shifts and and the nervousness in the market. And I think now is a good time to come back on and discuss it a little bit more and understand how much of that nervousness materialized. Um, and then if there is behavior that's that's changing, and it sounds like UA behavior is relatively consistent. Um, and as I said, on the, the platform side of the business, we're seeing people reevaluate um, after the changes, but not, uh, not panic, I don't think. Yeah, and from my perspective, guys, as I alluded to earlier, you know, these changes either have or, do, or we do not believe will have the same impact that ATT had, right? And we don't we expect there to be, you know, some decline, but I don't think that the decline, you know, is going to be super drastic. Like we're not going to see 50% drops here. Like maybe we'll see 10, 20%. But, you know, for, you know, what Ross was saying about going into a, a more privacy centric and and people first you know setup that's good for for everyone right in terms of you as a user yes the ad companies and the publishers lose a little bit but it's the right thing to do so i think yeah we are going to see you know probably a, a little bit more of a decline throughout the year 
However, again, I don't think we can, we can, you know, some business will be heavily affected. I'm not going to lie. Some business might go under because of this. But I think at least from our perspective, the effect has been, you know, um, not as, as bad as it could have been. We're still surviving. We're still generating money. We're still growing. So, that's, yeah, I'm, that's, I'm happy with that. That's that's the uh, the most important. And now, since we're kind of going from the uh, the doom and gloom and and the scary scenarios to to like even talking about growth <laughs> and then positive incomes uh, outcomes, then um, could we end up this this podcast episode about um, you know uh, sort of a positive view of of what you are optimistic about in in the ad monetization, ad monetization trends in twenty twenty four? So, John, if we would start with you, like. Put a smile on everybody's face regarding ad monetization. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, look, I'm going to go back to, to the beginning of the conversation and say, like, I think uh, bidders will get better, they'll get stronger, they will have a bigger part of, of the waterfalls. A few companies will will do what Google has done and, and elect to only have, you know, bidders as part of that, and hopefully, you know, that in turn, that competition, that auction will generate more revenue and ARPUs will go up. So that is the idea of why these technologies were built and the update in the industry was done. So I'm hoping that that hypothesis comes true and all of us are better off. And we, we save time and resources from not having to spend, you know, countless hours in waterfalls doing optimization. So resource cost goes down a little bit, a little bit. How about Ross? Yeah, I, I don't think a huge departure from, from what I said beforehand. I, I think there's... There's a lot of optimization efficiency that should come through this, um, and I would love to see that realized. Um, I mean, personally, I'm I'm looking forward to a year where we're not kind of making sure that everybody is ready for change. I'm looking forward to really getting back to sitting down with our partners and building new value rather than making sure that everything is safe, um, which I think has probably been the, the theme from the last 12 months. And I think really from our side, customization, like building the ability to optimize in different ways other than just a waterfall is a big investment from our, our platform side of things. Um, and the the ability, as I said, to really use the data that publishers do have in a privacy first way to generate material value. Those are the, the, the ad mob and ad manager conversations that I want to be having next year, not um, kind of trying to interpret changes in the landscape and, and minimize risk. I want us to get, get back to uh, to really positive growth with all of our partners. And I feel we're coming out the end of that tunnel. All right. Sounds amazing. And Ross, how can people listening to this get in touch with you and your team to discuss these matters further? I, hopefully anyone can find any of the, the sell side teams if they need to. As I said, we... Uh, um, People know where to find me, uh, I hope, in, in Europe. And we have colleagues all over the world in, in local offices. Um, if anyone wants to talk about what we, we can do or what we've been building for, for customization, for first-party data, and, and everything we have going forward to streamline the, the bidding optimizations and the, the revenue per user we can generate for people, then please do reach out to the teams in any of your local markets um, to discuss that. And if anyone doesn't, doesn't know where to find their team globally, they're more than welcome to reach out to me and I can I can help Ruth anything. Or well, they can Google it. Yeah, they can Google that. it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, no, no, I don't say that it's... Uh, I've been waiting to say, I was saving that joke the whole session. I was like, I'm yeah. going to put it in there. Oh my God. I feel like... Had to clap. <laughs> there is another Ross Brockman somewhere and I believe he runs quite a, a successful cider business somewhere in the southwest <laughs> of, uh, of the UK. Um, he is not me. Please don't ask him. Uh, please <laughs> find me because he will be very confused. All right, so link in the description to talk to Ross Brockman if you if you're not talking currently to your own uh, Google partner, and don't ask John about ad monetization. Contact John if you want to publish games on Quality platform, right? <laughs> so, um, sure. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, we, we always have to end up with a show. Thank you, Ross, and thank you, John, for for coming in and discussing. The advanced ad monetization trends. This is something that I have to probably listen three times because I'm so stupid. But for those who understand this topic, I think this was a very enlightening and for others probably learned a lot of new things. So thank you, gentlemen. Thank you, guys. Thanks, everybody, for listening.